everybody here at the Zero Hour in a castle tour somewhere. <laughs> I, 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 was, uh, I spent the last few days prior and all with family, I'll be staying the next few days after uh, visiting some of the castles. And one of the castles I just visited before coming here was the Dune Castle where uh, Monty Python filmed the Holy Grail. And uh, so, in the spirit of Monty Python, I'll say, and now for something completely different. <laughs> Uh, so, in the introduction, I was introduced as a original human girl scientist, and then I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, and then St. Jude Children's Research Hospital brought me down to the United States from Canada, originally Canadian, A. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, uh, so then I really learned nuts and bolts of editing and editing production and uh, working with authors about grants and manuscripts and things of that nature. Uh, uh, then I joined the Taxis Communications, a global uh, scholarly communications company. We've got excellence in scholarly conferences. It's very close to our tagline, which is excellent, excellence in scholarly communication. And we help fundamentally, we work with pharma, we work with publishers, but fundamentally we help authors get published. That's what we do, it's what we've been doing for 13 years, is working with authors around the world, uh, initially in Japan, throughout Asia, now Latin America and everywhere, uh, in helping them make the best possible paper uh, on their hand. And so, what I wanted to talk about today, and, and when uh, Gordon invited me to come and speak today, uh, it was all about cultural sensitivity. And so I labeled my talk, East versus West, why there's a crisis in your inbox. And it gets to the point of, you know, why are people no shows at meetings? Maybe it's because they didn't get their visa at the last minute or they were not allowed to leave. And these are, these are things beyond their control, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But I'll also talk about things that are within their control, and fundamentally, by being an English second language author, what are the challenges that they face in submitting a, public, uh, a document for publication, and being in the East, and in some cases specifically China, behind a, an internet firewall, what that means for their uh, knowledge of Western guidelines and, and learnings, and, and so these are the types of things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so when Gordon invited me to come speak at IEEE, uh, I, I, without hesitation, said yes, and he'll uh, remember that I, without hesitation, said yes. But I really didn't know what Coco was, and, uh, and all kinds of things went through my mind. <laughs> Speaking at a restaurant has really got me excited because they have happy hours and all of things. And uh, that really, as, as much as it was uh, intellectually satisfying, it really didn't get to the heart of the issue. And I, I'm talking about this because I'm an outsider for IEEE, so I had no idea what Coco was. And I use this as sort of a, a case scenario for an Asian author trying to publish in a Western journal. They have no idea, so what do they do? They, they go to the literature, they go to the web, they go to... So I went to the American website, and I was trying to find out what Coco was. And it says, a little, not much, sort of like insignificant. And I said, oh, that doesn't make sense. Actually, is not a little insignificant organization. So Coco absolutely has to be much more than that. And again, in a train of thought of an author looking for a Western journal, they have no idea of many of the titles, and they will get to predatory publishing. This is one of the reasons why they are so prone to predatory publishers, is because they, well, they may know of a journal of endocrinology or a journal of ABC uh, uh, electronics. Uh, there are, there's now the international journal of the same, and and so they don't, and the branding is very good, so they don't know. So, <clears throat> but when I finally found on fell on the IEEE Boko site. I realized, you know, this is really something special, and uh, and I wanted to be part of it, and and uh, then I started getting my head into the into the event. <clears throat> so when I talk, I often say the world is so flat. We through globalization, we've made the world so flat. And people talk, they've written books about the world being so flat, but I say it's so flat, like a piece of parchment that is now starting to curl, and all the edges are coming back at us, and that's where we're feeling now. So when we were doing globalization. We were pushing our agenda on the world, whether it be through Europe or Asia, or through the, the US or the West. We were pushing our agenda on the world. And now, to some degree, the world is pushing their agenda back on us, and, and in a good way. And one of the reasons why we're finding challenges in the West is we're not used to the culture of the East. Quite honestly, the majority of us in the room 
uh, who most of you guys are probably well traveled, but the majority of people in, in the West really don't understand what's going on in the East. Uh, so when everything that happens in your daily life, always think that the world is so flat it's starting to curl. And context is at the root of everything. High context cultures versus low context cultures. So high context of Middle East, Asia, Africa, South America is very relational, collectivist, intuitive, uh, contemplative. These cultures are less governed by reason rather than intuition, uh, less governed by reason than, than intuition and feelings. Bottom line, the take home, there's a quote here from a Japanese manager explaining cultural communication style to an American, and he says, we are homogeneous people, we don't have to speak as much as you do here. We say one word and we understand ten, but you guys have to say ten to understand one. And that's really a difference between high context and low context. Uh, high context tends to be more indirect and more formal, flowery language, humility, elaboration, apologies are typical. On the low context side of things, we're very logical and linear, individualistic and action-oriented, very specific. So we get down to the, into the meat of the facts and we evaluate one after another. We take discussion to the end. Uh, the communications are straightforward in many places bold. Um, we, we strive to be absolutely clear and uh, listening to the general counsel the other day and talking of uh, the culture of, of uh, of uh, contracts, you know, in Asian cultures, the contracts are very arm waving, very short uh, compared to American contracts, which can be 20, 30 pages or more. And the high contacts, the West, the distrust contact, uh, contracts that are lesser. Um, and, uh, and so there's lots of clashes, but this all pours in the high context versus low context, all pours into the understanding of how to publish. And so what are the challenges in globally uh, scholarly communication? Obviously there's geographic diversity in the class of culture that I've talked about, the polarization of context, English as a second language, which leads to plagiarism and leads to unintentional plagiarism. If I don't understand how to write English, and I see things and I read things, I'm going to take those in my notes and I'm going to write it out verbatim. But, you know, two months later, I can't remember whether I wrote that verbatim or, or whether I paraphrased it, but it looks great, I'm going to put that and use it in my paper. And so that is unintentional. It's not, it's not that these people are, are actively trying to plagiarize. Or if I'm in China, the you know, best way to pay homage to my supervisor, my mentor, is to take his or her own words and put them in my paper. And while that's fine if you're citing it and giving reference to where you've taken that information, if you're not, it's not fine. It's plagiarism. Maturity and age. Uh, what we don't really understand is in many Asian cultures, to get your PhD and, and be in a professional situation, you may be as much as two or three years younger than our Western peers. So there's a level of maturity, educational, professional training and exposure that a PhD or an MD uh, has that just, or, or a, uh, an engineer has that is just not of Western standard. Uh, the acceptability, uh, accessibility and ex to acceptable practices and guidelines, there's barriers to the understanding of that, there's barriers to the understanding of what the expectations are that, uh, that is required of them. And now on top of all that, we have this huge tsunami of manuscripts coming first out of China, next will be, next wave will be India, Latin America, and I say tsunami because it's not a tidal wave. We think that over the last couple of years there's been a tidal wave of manuscripts coming forward to us. It's not a tidal wave, it's a tsunami. It's going to come in one, and it's going to get bigger, and it's going to swell more, and it's going to swell more. So if you, you think you're challenged now, uh, two years time, five years time, we're going to be in a very difficult situation with the number of manuscripts coming forward. And with this number of manuscripts going forward, you have to share a voice issues. How does a young investigator possibly get published in a high impact journal when all these papers are coming forward? Or even a low impact journal, or even a Western author competing against Asian authors or Latin American authors for those that share a voice in the, in the quality literature. These are all issues that are forthcoming. And then on top of that, to make things worse, is the emergence of predatory practices. 
But I will qualify that in my experience, the majority of career researchers in any culture fundamentally want to do what's right. They just, if given culturally matched, emphasize culturally matched instruction, and show them the benchmark, which is very critical, you've got to show them what is expected of them, that they will meet, if not surpass that benchmark, but the key is the clarity of instruction. In the US, the job market is tough. In China, the job market is even tougher. I mean, these are images from the web of a college job fair in Beijing. You know, I can't imagine, you, you look at the scrambling here to get the, their uh, CVs, and I can't imagine that. I've experienced it. I'll show you a picture later about the, the absolute fever of gaining information uh, in some of the presentations that we've done throughout Beijing and other places. But this is the culture that they're coming from. And it is a culture that we have to appreciate the struggle that they are under to get ahead. An undergraduate student in China, and I don't want to pick on China, but it's, it's one of the more polarized things, but you could say it in India, you could say it in many places in Asia, uh, they're often assigned a school to attend. They're often assigned a specific major to study in. It's not their choice. They are stuck in what they are doing and are, in some cases, crying to get out, but they have to publish to get their PhD. They have to publish to maintain their professional standard. And while they have some training in English through the national curriculum um, and the modern training in listing, they have very poor training in actually being able to describe things. Scientific writing is not part of the undergraduate curriculum in any way. Uh, they have almost no training in scientific writing, and everything is usually taught by non-native English speakers. So it is a challenge on top of a challenge on top of a challenge, and their English second language challenge. As they get into graduate school, it's more or less the same thing, and although you uh, may expect that uh, the mentorship would, would pour in, there is rarely any mentorship, true mentorship. You have your position as a patriarchal society. You are uh, required to um, to do what you do, even though you may not. It's not your passion, but you and you re report to your mentor, and everything you do, you have to say face in front of that mentor. You have to say face in, in front of your peers, and so you get a rejection letter from uh, a journal. You're never going to show that rejection letter to anybody. And the journal says, well, we sent this rejection letter, but it wasn't really a rejection letter. We were wanted them to resubmit, but we lost them. They never replied. They never got back to us. Well, I can say that it's possibly faced. They, they, first of all, English second language, they need to have understood the subtleties of the rejection letter that they could have resubmitted. But that, that's crushing to them, crushing to their career. They buried that letter. You will never hear from them again. And that, that happens time and time again. It's something for us to be very sensitive about in how we write those rejection letters. Clear, concise English uh, with a lot of flowery language of, you know, please, we would be very interested if you were to resubmit so that they can, can catch that paragraph in the rejection letter and, and realize that this is not just rejection. Uh, there's rarely any training in publication standards and practices, which is a huge issue. So when you add it all up, English or Parish is top of the list. It, it just is. Uh, fundamental channels, challenges in English language expression because of training, difficulty in note taking, quoting, paraphrasing, <coughs> summarizing. Um, they're uh, usually younger than in the West. They lack the mentorship presence. Uh, their understanding of research ethics and good publication practices are less than what we are exposed to in the West. But I assure you, I've talked to many postdocs and graduate students in the West, and they have next to zero understanding as well. So it's not just an Asian thing, it's just, quite honestly, it's an educational issue that we just haven't got by. But clearly the byline bias, if you have Dr. Chin and Dr. Wang and Dr. Wong on the, uh, the byline of the paper, there is a byline bias in the publishing industry. Oh, no, I'm not on the paper uh, from China or from Malaysia or from wherever uh, because of that we, in many cases, have been burdened by poor language in the past or fraud or other things, and we project this onto the paper, and that's wrong. We, we should not be projecting any byline bias into the paper. The share of voice in literature I've talked about and avoiding pitfalls of predatory publishing. Uh, 
So one of the quirks of English language is you don't have to be really smart to read this. In English language, it doesn't matter what order the letters are in the words. The only important thing is the first and last letters are positioned in the right place. The rest of the letters can be jumbled, and you can still read this without a problem. This is because the human brain does not read every letter by itself, but looks for sentence and language patterns. Okay? And we think Asians have an English language challenge. The English language structure is not exact, so the ability to put it together, and in case you couldn't read that, <laughs> um, the English language structure is wrought with patterning issues that beyond English language challenges, there are pure mistake challenges. So it is you know, an honest mistake to make a spelling mistake to be able not to craft a sentence properly. The publication anatomy. So this is a one study. Other studies show that the crossover between the number of share of voice and the measure of number of well, percentage being 100 percent. The Chinese papers versus the U.S. papers. There's more papers coming out of China than the U.S. Some said it would happen in 2013. The recent SDN study says it's happening in 2015. So right now, rest assured, there's more papers coming out of China than there is coming out of the U.S. They're not great papers, all of them, but there's definitely science papers, nature papers. There's a lot of great papers coming out of Asia, not to be ignored. This only goes to 2011, but you can see the astronomical increase in papers coming out of China. The Chinese government, going back into the 90s, just changed, so cranked up the pressure and the volume of research coming out of China is astronomical. But behind that is India, South Korea, and Brazil. Uh, so when I say tsunami, these are waves that are coming forward at us. So, so because of the challenges that we face, at Edition, we do a lot of behind the scenes research and, and uh, trying to understand what the challenges are and the difference between East and West with respect to researchers and editors. So in short, what we did is we ran two surveys which were sort of butterfly polar opposites of each other, uh, asking editors or asking authors um, what they understood about good publication practices and then asking editors of Western journals how Asian authors fare in good publication practices. And we had a pretty good uh, cross-section of Japanese, Chinese, Korean authors and, and journal editors. Uh, total respondents about 326 and 54 journal editors from uh, pretty good high impact Western journals. And a lot of data was captured. But the, the clear data that I want to show is authors, how they rated self-rating, their understanding of good publication practices versus journals encountering problems. And what I love about this is that the authors believe that they're really doing quite well on a scale of seven, but the editors are thinking the exact polar opposite. And that's the divide. The, uh, you, you think you have good um, instructions for authors, and while we may understand that not many people read them or look at them, if you ask an Asian author, have you read the instructions for authors? Oh yes, I've read them right through. I know everything. I, I, I've done it all. And they they believe, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, they honestly believe, because I, I honestly believe they want to fundamentally do the right thing, but they honestly believe that they are doing the right thing. And yet we don't see that. And that's the disconnect. And that's where the culture and their training and our our failure at proper instruction and benchmark, showing benchmarks and thresholds, it's a combination of culture and our failure that creates this gap. Uh, we, we've given a, a lot of, uh, I've given a lot of presentations through Asia and China, and as an organization we have not anything compared to uh, I should believe but about 300 a year. This, this was the picture I alluded to earlier in the beginning. We have a staff member in the middle of this mall, and she's handing out uh, DVDs of, uh, of material on good publication practices. And she, for about 15 minutes, was absolutely mobbed to get these people wanting to get this information. So there's a thirst, there's a hunger, there's a, there's a quest to do what is right, there's a quest to gain that Western understanding. It's up to us to create that Western understanding and make it easy for them to access it. But you have to choose the right training approach, and one size definitely doesn't fit all. 
if you're a young researcher, you like the one day, two day hands on workshops, but if you're a senior researcher, in some cases because of face, you want to have very short periods of time where your knowledge or lack of knowledge is exposed to your, um, your people around you. Uh, if you're, in a, in, you're giving a workshop in Japan, nobody in the room will speak until the most senior person voices his or her opinion. And you're asking, you know, why is nobody asking any questions? Well, you haven't facilitated it for the most senior person in the room to open up. And you have to plan your room in many regards to make sure that you have some senior people there willing to open up. Once they open up, then others will start to engage. So these are learnings about culture that you need to be sensitive to. And uh, you know how material is presented is, is very different as well. And senior researchers like heavier discussion-based articles, lectures, videos, and young researchers like it spoon-fed to them very much like the like the West. It's not not significantly different, but the dynamics in the room are definitely different, and you need to be sensitive to that. Uh, icebreaker introductions in Japan get that discussion flowing even before uh, the session starts. You will often see forced interaction. You know, turn to the person next to you, give them your business card, and instruction to, to break the ice, to force that change to happen in the room. Change slides slowly, talk slowly. Um, the, hand, the relevant material will be handed at the beginning of the session in Japan. In other cultures, you don't want to do that because it breaks down the, uh, it breaks down the room. Everybody, after having flipped through all the material, doesn't, don't listen, they figure, okay, we'll have all the material. But in Japan, they, they wish to orient themselves to the material very early in it. Japan and China, people are very punctual. In South Korea, they arrive late. And so if there's anything important in your discussion, you have to present that later in the presentation. Uh, again, cultural differences that we need to be aware of. The, uh, I talked about author seniority, or researcher seniority in the room, and that will dictate the participation. Um, the, uh, if you ask, in the case of writing workshops or things of this nature, you know, send your writing to us in advance of the workshop so we can actually go through it during the workshop. In Japan, this does not work at all. In other cultures, China and Korea, it works uh, quite well. Uh, but the reason why it doesn't work in Japan, in my opinion, is again because of face. The last thing they want to do is to have their paper talked about openly and all the mistakes, even though it's anonymized, all their mistakes talked about openly in the room. So things that keep me awake at night, um, like almost everything in Asia, you take one step back and the real story is very different. This is. You know, I literally only took 10 steps back, and you can see the difference between a, 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 a hospital scenario and, and all the commerce that is around the hospital, um, primarily the sale of food. But that is often the way it is in Asia. Nothing is necessarily what it appears to be on face value. And you have to always, always be thinking of what are the layers and layers and layers and layers beneath what you're seeing. And that comes into manuscript submissions and conference participation, uh, and even you know, concepts of Guanxi where you stroke someone's back and they stroke your back many times. Um, if you invite a Chinese author uh, to a specific event, uh, you may wish to give them, in a social setting, five minutes to just have a mic and talk about anything they want to talk about. Sometimes they'll talk about family, sometimes they'll talk about their professional existence. But just the fact that you've given them that opportunity to do a public address in a social setting or professional setting, when you go back to China, it, the doors will be open for you anytime. time, the concept called Guangxi. Um, so also in, in China, many Asian areas, it's, it's very common to seek support to accomplish your career goals. You're a busy person, and so how can you possibly be writing all the papers and everything you need to uh, publish? And 
So the idea of plagiarism and predatory publishing and authorship for sale and all sorts of other things in a society that's very service oriented, it doesn't even resonate with them that it's wrong. And things are absolutely changing. I don't want to give the opinion that it's the way, but it doesn't occur to them that it's wrong to have somebody else do the research or to, uh, to buy a paper or to do other things. Uh, it is just part of the culture. And hence, predatory practices absolutely flourish in China and other Asian countries. This is serious because it is going to uh, erode the integrity of our literature over the next two to five years. And we cannot educate fast enough. And we've been, we've been trying to do education in any number of ways, but we are literally just scratching the surface. And the unfortunate thing is that, I'll jump to this side first, the predatory access, every as aspect of publishing is now has a predatory element to it, whether it be an editorial or a solicitation, peer reviewer solicitation, manuscript solicitation, peer review practices if they exist, all, and now predatory author services, authorship for sale, plagiarism, writing fraud, data fraud, everything that comes into manufactured papers. In two years' time, the sophistication of these websites, and they're already, already looking very sophisticated, the sophistication of these websites is going to be so good that in two years' time, the average Asian author will not be able to identify what is an ethical author service, what is an ethical publishing venue, versus what is predatory. And that is serious for the integrity of the literature. Uh, share a voice keeps me awake at night because the tsunami of papers we are not prepared for. The Western author isn't prepared for the competition that is forthcoming to get a good paper into a good journal. They are not seeing this swell of good material that is eventually and is starting to come out of Asia. That swell of very good research material is quite honestly going to shadow the Western literature because all of a sudden if there's more papers coming out of China than in the US or out of Asia than US and Europe alone, um, then you only have a half of your voice has a chance to get into a good uh, publication. And that's going to change the literature forever. But what are the institutions doing about this? How are the institutions facilitating the discoverability of good research if they can't get in a good journal? How are they facilitating the discoverability in a lower impact journal? Not that lower impact journals are lesser journals in different sectors in, of academia. Impact factor is not as heralded as in medicine. But what are the institutions doing? Institutions get to do public relations and tweet and, and blog about your paper just to get that discoverability in Google. And what will the author need to do to get share of voice? Especially the Asian author. You know, they are they are the tsunami, but they're competing against the same share of voice. And uh, so all of this makes for a very interesting scenario coming forward in the next couple of years. It's exciting times. And I I got a, a kick when I came across this movie in China called The Chef, the Actor, and the Scoundrel. Very much that good at that and the ugly. Uh, uh, and you can joke about knockoffs in China, but the reality is that they're really two different movies. Uh, the Chef, the Actor, and the Scoundrel, I love the title because it personifies good publication practices. You have the honest author. You have the actor who isn't is acting like they're an honest author, so guest authorship. And you have the scoundrel who is doing authorship for sale and, and all the fraud in, in writing. And to add ironies on ironies, the, uh, uh, the movie is, is a comedy about the, um, the kidnapping, the Chinese kidnapping of a Japanese scientist and trying to extract information out of this uh, Japanese scientist. Um, and it, it is a very slapstick comedy. I just love the, the, the context of the movie and it really personifies what's happening in publishing, that you have the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And unfortunately, the ugly is what we really have to worry about because the swell of the ugly is going to affect the integrity of literature. Um, and behind that swell of ugly are all these cultural issues that I've talked about, the, uh, the struggling author in Asia trying to get published in the Western literature, 
they need the instruction. They need to see what the benchmark is. When they see the benchmark, they will exceed it, and things will start looking a little bit more rosy. And with that, thank you.